Brian alluded to this last week a little bit uh, about my love of the word immediately in the book of Mark. In the book of Mark, the word immediately comes up probably about three times every chapter. Uh, it, it is said a lot in, um, in the book of Mark. Uh, but but what we see happening in chapter 7 is a bit of a transition. So uh, chapters 1 through 6, they cover about a year of Jesus' life. And then the last couple verses of chapter 6 cover like another year of Jesus' life. Um, so it's, it's pretty interesting how like so much scripture can cover so much time. And then how so little scripture can cover so much time. Uh, but, but it kind of sums up chapter 6 and says that Jesus started going throughout the area and people came to him and were looking to be healed. Anyone who touched him of his garment was healed. And so this is just what we know was happening for however long it was happening, right? Uh, but what we know is that Jesus gained really quick popularity. Within a couple years, like he became really, really popular. We've seen this happen in our culture. Anybody uh, know of a comedian named Nate Bargatze? Anybody? Anybody? Just a couple? Come on. Come on. Seriously. Like, if you know Nate Bargatze. Yeah, so, so more than a couple people know who Nate Bargatze is. If I would have asked you that question three years ago, you would have been like, I have no idea who you're talking about. Right, and and the reality is that's because Nate Bargatze spent the like first twenty years that he was doing stand-up comedy, living in a one-bedroom apartment in New York City, sleeping in till two in the afternoon, and then going out to every open mic he could find just to try and do stand-up comedy because it's what he wanted to do so bad. And then finally, after he actually left New York City, he moved back to Nashville, Tennessee, and had uh, his daughter, he uh, had an opportunity to do a 30-minute special on this Netflix show called Stand Ups. And this happened in, I think, 2018. And so in 2018, he did this 30-minute special on the show Stand Ups, and then from that, he just exploded. He now has, I think, four one-hour-long uh, comedy specials that you can watch on various different streaming services and, and things like that. And he is actually on a tour right now, and he was on one last year as well, where he just goes around from one huge arena to another, and he actually tells jokes for nearly 20,000 people per night. Uh, where, you know, just a few years ago, his biggest crowds were 150 to 300 people. Now, that's just, that's one story of someone who gained a lot of popularity really, really fast and really, really quickly, and there are other ones as well, uh, but, but this is kind of what's happened to Jesus. No one really knew who he was, and then at the age of 30, he starts this public ministry, and he begins to gain a following, and he gains a following, and he gains a following, and he gains a following, and now there is just this really big, like, everyone is, is coming out to see Jesus, including people who Jesus doesn't necessarily Necessarily want attention from if you know what I'm saying like some of the people that you don't want to gain attention from are starting to take notice of Jesus and who he is and that's where we start chapter 7 all right so chapter 7 says this the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus all right so this is this is important the Pharisees teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem they're at the big boy church all right if y'all don't know all right they're they're at the temple they're the they're the best of the best these are the smartest and brightest and most learned and most uh, sought after for advice when it comes to following God of anyone in this society Okay, so it, these guys are now taking notice of Jesus. That's, that means something. They've left Jerusalem and shown up in a smaller town, in a smaller village where Jesus has been doing ministry just to hear him teach and to see what the fuss is all about. And they get into this place of where they're around Jesus and they saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. Now, here's a Bible study note for you, okay? If we're we're uh, moving away from sermon to a Bible study now, all right? Here we go. Uh, a, a Bible study note is if you're looking at the scriptures and you see something uh, put in a parenthetical statement, 
Okay, that means within parentheses. I know, I used a big word. Uh, so you, you, put something, you put something in parentheses, um, there's a reason for that. He's giving context. And the reason why he's giving context is because Mark is writing to Gentiles who did not know or adhere to these Jewish customs or traditions. So they most likely would not have like known what was really going on or why Jews did this before they ate or anything else like that. And so he's saying this because these Gentiles, he's letting them in on why they would do the things that they were doing. And, um, and so I think it's, I think it's just, it's, it's neat to know that and just know like, okay, this is, the, this is who he's talking to. This is the group of people he's talking to. He's talking to people like us who also did not grow up doing these things, adhering to these certain rules and regulations and so forth and so on. Here's the other thing that I think is really neat about just that you can, like if you were to just look at that, you'd be like, oh, okay. So they're supposed to wash their hands before they eat. And we can read that and go like, everybody should wash their hands before they eat because if you don't, you're disgusting. Um, <laughs> or or we, could, we could go, well, what is such a simple law why does God give such a simple law to his people? And there, there are, I think, two, two really key things we can take away from this. The first is he gives this simple law to his people because he wants to set them apart from the other culture at large. Okay? He wants them to look different and handle things differently. And to be honest, he wants people to handle things in a more human way. I mean, that's really what he's getting at. He's like, I want, I want this to be a more, I want, I want you to do things and interact in a more human way. And so he gives them this, this law. Now, here's the other thing. This law is good for them, isn't it? We all know it is, right? We wash our hands so we don't get sick when we eat, um, and we, we carry around germs and all these other kinds of things, right? So we wash our hands because of that. Like, we want to... We want to just make sure that, that like, we're staying healthy. The fact that God would give that as a law just points to the fact that God gave the law not to place heavy rules of burden and responsibility on people's head, but he gave people rules and responsibilities because he loves them. And he cares about them. And he cares about their flourishing. And so he says, hey, I don't want you to, I don't want you to do this Instead, I want you to, to live this way, and the reason I want you to live this way is because it's better for you, right? I know there are some moms in the room going, can I get an amen, you know? Like, they're like, I, I do this all the time, right? But, but I just think it's neat. You can look at something very simple and just kind of gloss over it, or you can look at it and go, wow, there's something so simple that points to the heart of God for his people, that he loves them and that he cares for them and that he wants them to flourish so uh, let's keep reading verse 5 says so the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders instead of eating food with defiled hands so the the Pharisees asked Jesus a question like why don't your disciples wash their hands before they eat that's what they're supposed to do why don't they do it verse 6 Jesus answers with scripture. He says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Here, uh, I, I want to camp out on this verse that Jesus draws out of the Old Testament for just a second because I think it's really uh, meaningful and powerful for, for a couple of reasons. The first one is I think we should really ask ourselves the question. We should ask ourselves the question, is our worship of God, is it just lip service or is it actually genuine? Do we say we are Christians and yet then dishonor God with the way in which we live our life? If we do, then we likely fall into the same camp as these Pharisees. You, you say like, oh, I'm going to worship God, I'm going to come to church, but nothing about your character or who you are changes to look more like Jesus. And that is lip service 
It is not genuine transformation. And Jesus is in the business of genuine transformation. He changes people's lives and gives them new ones. And so when our lives don't change, we, we have to ask ourselves, are, are, we, are we saying all the right stuff and yet our hearts still remain far from God? Because that isn't what God wants. That isn't what God desires. He doesn't desire for us to go to church and sing some songs. He desires for our hearts to be bent toward him because his heart is bent toward us. And so that, that is something we should ask ourselves every time that like, we are walking into a church building, when we, are, when we are living our life every day as we wake up and take the breath that God's given us to breathe, is, is today, am I, a, am, am I truly, am I, am I walking the walk or is it just lip service? Now, here's the other thing that I think is really important here is that the God of the universe has a word for these men. He grabs a word from Scripture and he gives it to these men and speaks directly to them with God's word. Here, here's something that I, that I want to challenge you to as you engage with this book that you would not just merely read it to gain information or to gain knowledge or to have some sort of well-thought-out theological argument, but that you would read it slowly and meditatively looking for the word that God has for you that might correct you, that might challenge you, that might rebuke you, because that is where transformation takes place. Look at the word of God and don't just go, oh, well, yeah, I'm going to try and get through it as much as possible so I can say I've read it, I've read the book, I've done the thing, you know, I, like, that, that's great. What would be more powerful and more meaningful is if we as followers of Jesus would sit with it and listen for a word from God because it can change us. In a very, very powerful way. I want to I share a quote. This is a long quote, but it, it's a really, really uh, great perspective. I really love. It's from Robert Mulholland, um, uh, who, who says this. He says, Our general mode of reading is to perceive the text as an object out there over which we have control. We control our approach to the text. We control our in." Interaction with the text, we control the impact the text has on our lives. This is why the how of spiritual formation is perhaps more profound than you realize. This is why the how of the role of scripture in spiritual formation is not so much a body of information, a technique, a method, a model, as it is a mode of being in relationship with God that we bring to the scripture. First, I suggest that your top priority be to listen for God. Seek to allow your attention and focus to be on listening for what God is saying to you as you read this book. Listen for God to speak to you in and through, around and within, over and behind and out in front of everything that you read. Keep asking yourself, what is God seeking to say to me in all of this? By adopting this posture toward the text, you will begin the process of reversing the learned mode that establishes you as the controlling power who seeks to master a body of information. Instead, you will begin to allow the text to become an instrument of God's grace in your life. I love that. Because so many of us, and I've done it so many times, right? Like, I'll, 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 I'll be like, oh, man, I got this great sermon idea. I'm just going to go grab the text, and I'm just going to figure out how do, I, how do I preach this passage so that people will, and, and it's all, I'm trying to control it the whole time. And my guess is you've done this too. 
that you've had some sort of ulterior motive or some sort of other agenda other than just letting God speak to you at the deepest levels of your heart and change and transform your life. Can we just, can we just let the word of God do what it does? Because it's more powerful than any double-edged sword. And it penetrates through our, our bone into the deepest parts of our heart and our soul if we go for it. But we got to go for it. And we can't just have some sort of ulterior motive trying to control it. Let God's word speak to us because if we give ourselves to it, it will. Here we go, verse 8. It says, you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. So the commands of God are summed up by the law uh, of Moses, which was 613 commands and 613 laws. Sounds like a lot, but I bet the United States has far more. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but but here, here's, the, here's the reality. It sounds like a lot, but, but the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they actually added on to it. And it was called the oral tradition. And so they brought this oral tradition, and they said, you know, well, this is actually, you should, you should actually go, you know, do this, you know, do this. And so, um, so they're doing this with a lot of the law. They're, they're adding to it, and, and they're teaching people to obey the oral tradition as if it's actually the law of God and the word of God, and it's just not. And, um, and Jesus has a problem with that. He says this in verse 9. He says, and, and he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother. And anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, if anyone declares that what they may have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is, devoted to God, then you are no longer, no longer let them do anything for their father and mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. <laughs> so the, the command, we, we, most of us probably have heard it, right? Because our parents told it to us over and over and over again, right? Honor your father and mother, son, you know. You better honor your father and mother. Uh, but but it's, it's one of the Ten Commandments. And, uh, and, and, and there is so much more depth to just like, hey, do what your mom says. You know? So much depth, more depth than just that. Um, which is how often we read it or how often we take it, right? Like if mom and dad say do something, I do it. Uh, because that's honoring your father and mother. In fact, Jesus says actually honoring your father and mother is actually looking after them in their old age. As they begin to age and as they begin to need more assistance and more help and more care, that you're there for them. And it's such a beautiful thing. I know so many people who are in this stage of life who are taking care of their moms and their dads or have taken care of their moms and their dads, some even their grandparents, into uh, the, the last days of their life. And it's just such a beautiful, beautiful thing to watch because it is such a beautiful display of what God's word means when it says to honor your father and mother. It's beautiful to see children doing that. And maybe you're a child who's doing that right now, and I praise God for you because you're, you're doing the word of God. That's awesome. Um, and my guess is most of us, if we aren't right now, we will at some point be in this stage. And my encouragement to you would be to remember to honor your father and mother. What was happening here is that the Pharisees, they, they, uh, their, their hearts were full of greed. Uh, and so they came up with this law that said, well, of course, wouldn't God want you to give your money to the church? Wouldn't he want you to give your money to God? Wouldn't he want you to give what you have to him? Because, I mean, after all, like, he's God, and he should be supreme in all your affections, and so forth and so on. And so they would use God's name in order to uh, have these people give money to God. And who benefits when people give money to God? The Pharisees who work in the temple and work for God and are God's messengers and God's chosen instruments to carry his laws. and all, you, you get what I'm saying? And so they came up with this way to benefit themselves because of their greed. What is in their heart is greed. It's not to follow the commands. It's not even to honor God. It's to honor themselves. And Jesus says, you do many such things like this. 
You've taken the law of God and you've made it work for your own benefit and for your own good. And that's not what it's meant for. That's not what it's intended to do. And so he says, you want to you talk to me and my disciples about not washing our hands before we eat? Right? It's that whole, uh, you know, pull the plank out of your eye before you try and remove the speck of your... Like, it's that whole, you know, thing. So Jesus is, you know, getting at what really matters to him, which is always going to be the heart. And so look at verse 14. So he continues. Again, Jesus called the crowd, okay? So, so think of this. The crowd's there. The Pharisees are kind of taken over. They want to they move the conversation in a specific direction. They want to challenge Jesus. They want to en- en- end up exposing him as a false prophet and as a false teacher. And then he says this back to the Pharisees and challenges them on the things that they've said. And then he calls the crowd around him and he starts to speak to them. He says, listen to me. Everyone, and understand this, nothing outside of a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. Are you so dull? I love that. (laughs) He asked, don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. So Jesus goes to these people, and I, I want to be clear here that what Jesus is talking about, because we can, I think we can misread this and honestly misapply this and uh, take this out of context and just to make it, make it really, again, make God's word beneficial to us and our own desires and our own uh, wants. Um, what Jesus is talking about here is he's talking about food, and I think it's important that we understand that. He's talking about there is no food that you could put in your body that is going to make you unclean. Uh, he is not talking about other forms of things that come into our hearts through other avenues. So the things that we look at, the things that we take in, the ways in which we've been shaped and molded by our family of origin, all of these things come at us from outside of our body and from outside of just you know, our physical condition and penetrate deep into our heart. And so we should really pay attention to the fact that Jesus, what he's talking about, about what comes in your body cannot defile you. There, there are things that if we give our bodies to them, they will defile our heart. And we should not miss that. What Jesus is specifically speaking to is food, okay? Uh, I, wanna, I wanna share uh, another quote from uh, Dallas Willard. He wrote in his book, Renovation of the Heart. He says, today we as a culture are schizophrenic on such matters. We want to say it doesn't make any difference what we look at or or hear. This, no doubt, is because we want to be free to show anything and to see anything, no matter how evil and revolting. But businesses still pay millions of dollars to show us something for 30 seconds on television. And they do that because they know that what we repeatedly see and hear affects what we do. Otherwise, they would go out of business. <laughs> so uh, he also says in this, he says, uh, he says, in fact, there is no place where this statement is more true than in spiritual formation. Garbage in, garbage out. That when you are trying to be formed into the image of Christ, if you want to look like Christ, you can't put garbage in and expect Jesus to come out. 
So if you want to be a living representation of Christ to the world, we have to put in the things into our lives that are going to manifest and cultivate the fruit of Christ and the fruit of the Spirit. You guys understand? So, so Jesus, because Jesus really cares about the heart, he does care about what goes in your body and what you take in. Um, he, it's just not food, okay? So the, the food is not the problem. But it's a lot of the other stuff. Um, it's the things that lead to our hearts being bent towards sexual immorality and anger and greed and malice, deceit, those things that make their way in. And so uh, to close today, because those things sound a lot like another writer in the New Testament, and I'm, uh, it, it, it's really interesting how Paul, um, who worked with Mark um, for a little while, uh, said very similar things to what Jesus just said about, about what defiles a person uh, and, and the heart of a person. And, um, and, I, and I think it's, this is, I'm, I'm going to read, I just want to read Colossians 3. Um, because Colossians 3, uh, 1 through 17, I want to actually challenge you to go memorize it. And I know many of you go, did he just say what I think he said? Uh, did he just say go memorize Colossians 3, 1 through 17? Yeah, memorize Colossians 3, 1 through 17. It might take you a year, but do it. Um, because, because, again, like this, this word can have a fruitful, fruitful, life-giving benefit to those who take it in and hold on to it. But, um, but I'm just going to read through it because it's a really, really powerful, powerful uh, message that Paul has here. And he talks about some of the same stuff that Jesus is dealing with. He says this, verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Let me just stop for a second. So, so Paul says, because you have been raised with Christ, um, and, and, and I want you to set your things on things above. I want you to set your, th your, your mind, your thoughts, your hearts on, on the things of Christ. I want your, 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 your face there. He says, for you have died. See, the journey of becoming a follower of Jesus. Let me, let me, just, let me just start right here. The starting point of becoming a follower of Jesus is that you die. You die to your old way of life and you're born again. So you're raised to this new life and you have a new life. That's the beginning. The question is, now what do you do with this new life that you've been given it? So when you said, I follow, I'm gonna be a follower of Jesus, you die to your old self. Who you once were should not be who you are anymore. Christ died so that you could have a new life, a new hope. And he says, and because you are in Christ, when Christ appears, you're gonna appear with him in glory. When he shows up, you, you're gonna be with him. That's, that's, the, that's the promise and the hope of the gospel. Is that if we're walking and we are dead in our sins, we can die to that life and be made new in Christ. And when he comes, man, we'll get to be with him for eternity. Praise God. Now, yeah. Verse 5 says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. So because, because you are a, a, a Christian, because you have become a follower of Jesus, now put to death all this stuff that, that's a part of your, your earthly, worldly self. Put away and, and kill. Actually, it's put to death, so, so kill it. Kill the sexual immorality, the impurity, the lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. You're just chasing after things to worship things. You're worshiping sex and money. You're worshiping, like, all these things that are not God. 
He says, kill all that stuff. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. It's because of this way of life that God is going to have to express his wrath, meaning he's going to have to punish people for eternity, just like he's going to invite people into his presence for eternity, which is sad, but true. He says, you used to walk in these ways in the life that you once lived. So notice he's talking about past tense. He's never, he's ne- he, once you're in Christ, it, your, your old life is something gone. Verse 8, he says, but now. Now, this is great. Something's changed. Something's different. This is, this is what Jesus is all about. He's all about life change. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge or renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. So he's saying, man, you are, you are learning to live and grow and become more like Jesus. So put all that stuff off. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So we're all, all his children. No matter what our socioeconomic status, what our race, what our gender, doesn't matter. We are all God's children in Christ. Therefore, as God's chosen people, I love that he says that we're his chosen people. He's speaking to Gentiles again, just so you guys know, Paul is an apostle to the Gentiles. God's chosen people were not the Gentiles, uh, and they, they were the outsiders. And, uh, and so, but God's chosen people, God's chosen people, you and I, God chose us. He loves us. He died for us, holy and dearly loved Clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? He's like, man, you have the opportunity here. Just take on these attributes of Jesus. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any one of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Say, forgive, like, like, don't hold on to those grudges. Forgive your brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't, 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 don't hold anything over their head. Offer them forgiveness because Christ has offered you forgiveness. And over all these things, over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. He's saying, if you have love, if you put on love, you, you have compassion, you have kindness, you have humility, you have gentleness, you have th- this ability to forgive and offer forgiveness when you need to because you have love. This is why Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the law and the prophets are summed up in these two things. You want to follow the law? Get love right. Get love right. This is what Jesus was trying to get these Pharisees to understand in Mark 7. Like, guys, you don't love right, so your heart's not right. He's saying love will take care of all of it. If you can learn to love like Christ, you can learn to forgive like Christ and be gentle like Christ and have compassion like Christ. Then he says in verse 15, he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace. Let the wholeness that comes through Christ, may that that be what you hold on to because you were called to live with this peace and this reconciliation. Be thankful. Be thankful. We got any thankful people in the church today? Yes, praise God. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another. Let the message of Christ, let the message of his love and his forgiveness, his grace and his mercy, let that message that you are never too far gone, that he's always there when the prodigal comes home. Let the message of Christ dwell 
Let it sit with you. Let it be the thing that, 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 that's always there. Let his grace never leave you, but let it dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing with God with gratitude in your hearts. I, I used to hear this verse a lot uh, when I was growing up as a, as a kid in the tradition that I grew up in. And, uh, and you know, I think, I think because of the tradition I grew up in, I miss the fact that these songs and these hymns and these spiritual songs, they're meant to teach us. They're meant to instruct us. They're meant to give us wisdom and insight into who God is. They're, they're supposed to be theology. And when we sing these songs about who he is, like we did right before um, I came up here, when we, when we sing songs about praise being a weapon that can silence our enemy, like these are songs that teach us about who God is and how powerful he is and how he works and moves. These songs matter. They're not just words on a page or things on a screen. They, they, they have power and meaning and purpose. In verse 17, he says, and whatever you do, whatever you do, you, you have a breath that you're breathing right now, whatever you do with that breath. You have a day today, whatever you do today. You have a, hopefully a day tomorrow. <laughs> Whatever you do, every moment of every day, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Live every moment for him. That people might make much of his name, not your name. <laughs> if there's something special about you, and there's something special about a lot of you, it's only because God gave it to you. And if there's something to be celebrated, it's the hope that you have in Christ. It's not your brokenness, I'll tell you that. So whatever you do, give it all for his name's sake. Give thanks to God, the Father, through him. Through him. Guys, this is what happens when our hearts are changed in the way in which Jesus desires our hearts to be changed. We become people who put off the old self and take on the new self. And the old self dies. And the anger and the rage and the malice and the sexual immorality and the impurity and the debauchery, all of those things pass away. And God begins to cultivate something new in our hearts because we've given ourselves to him in this way. And he begins to transform us in new ways. And we begin to look more like him. We begin to have the love that he has, and the forgiveness that he has, and the compassion, the gentleness, and the humility that he has. This, this is what it looks like when our faith is not just lip service, but when our hearts are really drawn toward the Father because we know that his heart is drawn toward us. It changes us. It transforms us. So that in everything we do, whether word or deed, it is our desire that everything we do be for his name. So if what Jesus cares about, let us care about the heart. Let us want to get that right. Moms, for just a second, take a look up here, because i got to say something. It's Mother's Day, so let me, let me just say this. All right? Jesus is talking to these Pharisees, and he's talking to them about the law, and he's talking to them about all of this stuff. And he, and he says to them, um, basically, like, it's not about rules, and um, it, it, it's about the heart. I, I know that there are times when our children mess up. I have four of them, and they mess up every day. Every day. And I want to say, stop doing that. Don't do that anymore. Can you cut it out? Please. <laughs> Whatever. You know, like that. And, and we, we, we try and correct them. But can I, just, can I just say something for a second? 
let us, let us go after their heart, not their behavior. Like when they do something that, that isn't in alignment with what we want them to do, maybe try and figure out why their heart led them in that direction and coach their heart, mother their heart, father their heart. Don't just father and mother their behavior. Don't just give them a bunch of rules of do's and don'ts, but go after their heart so that they want to do the right thing. Because they know that mom and dad, the rules that they do have, those rules are given because they love us. And they really care about our heart. That's what Jesus cares about most. And that's what, that's what we should be going after. So I just want to challenge you with that this morning. Go memorize Colossians 3, 1 through 17. Take it to heart. Let it seep deeply within you. And let it change you and transform you as only the word of God can. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning and uh, just the time that we had to be together. Uh, God, I pray that you will just bless, um, bless us to know you in deeper ways through your word. God, I pray that our hearts will just come alive by your love and by your grace. That our hearts will be drawn toward you because your heart has been drawn toward us, because you've offered us your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, salvation. God, because you've given everything for us, God, may we do everything, whether word or deed, for your name's sake. God, we love you and praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.